more coming up. The Michael Duke Show. Brad Keithley joins us every week to help us ask those questions like, what the actual hell is going on? I'll be honest with you. After reading this uh, opinion piece from Tim Bradner, I was scratching my head and saying exactly the same thing. Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Michael. That's the first time I'd heard that lead in. That's that's a, that's an interesting that's, promo. That's the first time anybody's ever heard that lead in, my friend. I'm just telling you, it's the first time anybody's ever heard it. But it's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking when I read this piece from Brad uh, Tim Bradner this morning. Um, because again, I mean, I you know, quite honestly, the entire piece is is devoid of any kind of common sense. And I again, that that one final paragraph near the end pretty much tells me everything I need to know about where Bradner's coming from on this. Because if he has heard no squawks from the public on the taking of the dividend, I think that he just has failed to get away from any of his high class cocktail parties or from in the bubble of the top, you know, five or two, five or four or three percent of the income earners out there, because that's all I'm hearing right now is the squawking about how the taking of the dividend is affecting people in the in the private economy. Yeah, I suppose we all live in a, live in our echo chambers, but I really was surprised about that part of Tim's piece. I, I, I was I was just I, I was sort of stunned generally as I read through it, because here here's here's the deal: um, we have a statute, we have a statute on the books uh, that says that fifty percent of the fund's earnings shall there's there's no that's the word shall be transferred. To the dividend account each year, and then there's another statute on the books that says the dividend account, the state shall then distribute the dividend account, uh, the the amounts of the dividend account, to Alaska citizens based on based on the formula for how you pay out the PFD. Both of those both of those statutes use the word shall. So Tim's going through this piece talking about yeah we don't have to do that we don't have to do that we can set it by appropriation. It would be good if we had a statute that told us what we're supposed to do, as as he talks about, you know, the need for fiscal certainty and and right. uh, and 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 a fiscal plan going forward. It would be good to have a statute that told us what we were doing, because then we'd have transparency, and then we would know what the rules were, and then we could go forward. We have a statute. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> that, I was just shocked as I as I was reading that. Tim knows that I, I, I just don't know what came over came over his mind, but we have a statute. We have a statute on the books that tells you that you transfer fifty percent of the of the of the of the earnings from the permanent fund calculated in the way the statute provides to the dividend account, and and to just ignore statutes. I mean, what, what would be what would be Tim's column? The question that was going through my mind: What would be the Tim's Tim's column? If we if we were dealing with the, these oil tax credits that have a statute on the books that, that specify how much the, the the legislature must transfer to the oil fund for distribution to the to the to the companies qualifying for these oil tax credits, cashable oil tax credits, what would Tim's reaction be if the legislature said, "Yeah, that statute, hell, you know, we're not going to pay attention to that. We're, we're just going to set it annually by appropriation." And we're going to set it lower than what the statute provides. He would explode. The Alaska right. Journal of Commerce would friggin' explode, and and they would go, you know, bananas about, you know, how Alaska is a rogue state. You can't rely on it. You can't trust it. We got a statute. You got to pay attention to it. Well, guys, we got a statute about the permanent fund dividend, and we're ignoring it. The Supreme Court didn't didn't even touch the dividend. Uh, even didn't even touch the statute. They just said they, they said, you know, you can you can underfund things, you can default on things, uh, and and that's what our constitution provides. But they didn't say the statute didn't apply. We've got a statute, Tim. If you want to live up to statutes, then you need to live up to this one. You can't just write columns and say, yeah, we'll do it whenever we want to. Well, yeah, essentially in this entire article, he's basically just saying, just live by the seat of your pants, do what you want. I mean, do what you you know. Just go ahead and just do it. 
And, uh, you know, the little people, they don't really need – and, again, the underlying tone of this whole article is that the little people just don't understand. And they're not really squawking anyway, so just let them do it. And then, of course, his, his ardent fervor for this POMV model, uh, you know, laid out in this thing is just, you know, uh, again uh, – it, to me, shows a real lack of understanding of, A, what the permanent fund was originally intended for, what it became, and, and how this works and why the POMV. Sure, the POMV is great for government, but it basically short-circuits the entire attempt of what Hammond and others had, had, had envisioned as far as sharing the Alaskan wealth. Yeah, we at some point we can talk in detail about the POMV. We we I mean the POMV is another way of dealing with inflation proofing. Uh, we've got one we've got one system for inflation set up for inflation proofing that's in the statute now. POMV is another way of of dealing with it. It's got its good points and its bad points, and 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 it does put a cap on distributions in a way, um, uh, but but it's. That, that to me, is something that, that, frankly, is debatable. It's not in the statute now, so if we're going to observe statutes, um, then we need to, you know, then we need to continue to use the inflation-proofing mechanism we've got in the statute now. But, uh, but, but that's, that's, an, that's an important piece. That's something that, that needs to be discussed. But the whole general tenor of the article, I mean, he, he does say, let's just do whatever we want. Let's just make whatever appropriations we want. But then, at the same time, he's got pieces in here that talk about, oh, but we need a st we need statutes to deal with, you know, the fiscal plan to provide certainty, to provide transparency, to provide guidelines, to provide reliability, to provide predictab predictability, and just goes, you know, and talks about the importance of statutes, and and just ignores. <laughs> there there is not one mention in this piece, Tim. If you're listening, there's not one mention in this piece of the fact we have an existing permanent fund dividend statute. And 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 if if we're if we're gonna set up this state as a state that can ignore statutes, that can ignore, you know, the rules that the legislature has set down for fiscal policy, then we do have a rogue state. And 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 please don't complain then if the if the next legislature goes in and underfunds uh, the the cashable oil tax credit, or K through 12, don't complain the next time the legislature comes in and underfunds uh, the BSA, the, the base student allowance, or Medicaid, don't complain the next time the legislature comes in and underfunds Medicaid. Yeah, you can all say, oh, there's statutes out there for that. There's formulas that govern how you're supposed to do that. Well, you know, if we're going to ignore statutes. <laughs> If we're going to ignore the permanent yeah. fund dividend statute that's still on the books, then, you know, Katie barred the door. We're just going to ignore everything. We're just going to, you know, do it by whim every time we send people down to Juno. Right. You know, welcome to the wild, wild west, because that's a, essentially what it would become. Forget about the rule of law. Forget about all this other stuff. Just welcome to the wild west where they do what they want to do and ignore statute. That's what they're advocating. It is. And, 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 and there's another piece in here, i got to admit, my blood pressure sort of went up at this one. It says, there's also the flack raised by the don't mess with my dividend crowd, our peculiar <laughs> resident Alaska red state socialist. How weird to tout conservative values with one hand and government welfare with the other. Tim, there's a statute. It's not, it's not like, it, it's, it's don't mess with my dividend. How about don't mess with my, my statute? I mean, don't mess with the rule of law. That's 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 a substantial part of what this whole debate is about. We've right. got a statute; it hasn't been changed. Yeah, there there is some. There's been a vote in the Senate to change the statute, a vote in the House to change the statute, the statute. But the votes aren't the same. The changes aren't the same, and the conditions that go along with that change in the statute is, is, isn't the same. We don't have a consensus on changing the statute until we do. The statute's still on the books. You, and, and to just advocate, you know, just, you know, underfund it whenever you want to. I just, you know, just set it, set, it by, set it by consensus of any current legislature as you go along. To advocate that, to advocate that you ignore statutes, to advocate that you ignore the rule of law, in my, in my sense, in, in, in my view, is just irresponsible. I mean, it's just, it's just asking for anarchy.
uh, in terms of the way we approach fiscal responsibility in the state. One more time, the Alaska Journal of Commerce, Tim Bradner, would explode if anybody advocated underfunding cashable oil credits. They would just go ballistic um, and argue about how you've got to be able to rely on statutes. You've got to be able to rely uh, on the rule of law. You've got to be able to rely on these things. Well, the same thing applies to the permanent fund dividend statute. You can't just yeah. ignore it. You can't write a 600-word piece and just not mention it. Uh, right, that's exactly. Not, well, and I'll say uh, I was highlighting pieces. I was highlighting, for, you know, phrases and sentences in this, and that was one of the other ones. I, you know, highlighted the one that I mentioned earlier. But you're right. The one where he talks about the "don't mess with my dividend" crowd, the resident Alaska red state socialists. Which, by the way, it wasn't our choice to be a socialist state. It wasn't our choice. That was handed to us by the federal government in statehood, where they said they must retain the mineral rights. Uh, from the citizens. So you can't own your own mineral rights. So again, it wasn't a choice, but it is, as we've talked about in the past, the highest expression of private property rights as a compensatory uh, you know, uh, 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 piece to basically compensate people for the loss of those uh, mineral rights on their private property. That's what it is. It wasn't our choice. We were handed that. And so then yep. to be mad at people or to mock people because they're mad when you take that right away from them, which is essentially what they're attempting to do by taking the dividend, I mean, to me just seems – I mean, it just flies in the face of what we're talking about. Oh, it does. It does, Michael. And the other, and the other thing about that argument when they say you know red state socialists uh, when they're talking about the dividend, think for a moment. H Hammond has a great piece, a great passage on this on, in his book, Diapering the Devil. Think, think about what you're saying for a moment. It is socialist for the gut for to, to argue that we ought to leave money in the hands of the private sector as opposed to confiscate as opposed to taking it, diverting it to government. It's socialist to argue that money that is set by statute, by the way, that money is set by statute to go into the private sector in the hands of citizens. Uh, uh, it's socialist to argue that it ought to remain that way as opposed to going to government. They've got it backwards. Those who argue that we ought to cut the dividend and remove, divert that money that's otherwise going into the private sector and divert it instead to go to government, that's the socialist argument. That's, that's yeah. the argument of, of communitizing um, uh, the revenues. What Hammond set up was absolutely the most conservative private sector uh, 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 capitalist approach you can have to put the money in the hand of in the hands of citizens. So it's, I mean, people who who want to argue that that you know, oh, the dividend socialist, it's not. It is capitalist because it's putting money in the hands of citizens, not in the hands of government. Right. Which I'm mean, again, by the way, government is already getting their share of that. And, of course, they're just proving the axiom once more that what they want is not only their share, they want half of your share as well, which is what they're attempting here. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just it's it, it's stunning to me that 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 people in that, that there are some people in this state who who are so protective of government that they think, you know, government's entitled to just take whatever money it wants whenever it wants. Uh, without just ignoring statutes as it goes, uh, and without you know, without you know, at least giving voters the opportunity to decide that it's that 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 we've got to protect government. Government is our first priority. When you hear Governor Walker talk about the fiscal crisis, it's never it's never about the overall Alaska economy. It's always about protecting government and protecting the government sector and protecting government jobs and protecting government programs. It's never about the overall Alaska economy. It, it, ICER, the ICER analysis has, has demonstrated that the PFD produces the most bang for the buck uh, in terms of generating overall income of all of the options that the, that the government has, uh, has available to it. And cutting the PFD has the, quote, largest adverse effect on the overall economy of any of the fiscal of any of the new, new revenue options that people talk about, it is a private sector capitalist program. To argue yep. otherwise, and, and particularly when you're arguing to ignore statutes, is just wrong. 
And that's the socialist argument, not the argument in favor of keeping the PFD. And again, uh, again, again, the, the irony here is that if the statute was completely being ignored in regards to fully funding uh, or to paying whatever the statutory minimums are to the oil companies, which, of course, is Bradner's you know, field and his and his industry that he caters to, then, of course, it would be all doom and gloom and how dare you. But since it's coming out of the public sector, it's coming out of private citizens' pockets, that it makes it okay. That you know, the thing in this whole article is is that there's not one mention, not one mention, not one discussion point about the size and scope of government, which of course is driving this entire demand uh, and, and appetite for more money. This is all about what the government has done, the size and the scope of government. And there's nothing to say that if they got more, because, again, past performance is indicative of future results, there's nothing to say if they got more, they would be any more responsible with what they were given this time around. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, they're, they're, we, we overbuilt government. We've overbuilt the university system. We've overbuilt our, our social programs. And we've overbuilt everything in this state during periods when oil was above $100. Uh, and, and now that oil is down and now that revenues are down and now that the state's economy is down, uh, rather than, than, than make the cuts necessary to right-size government to, to what we've got, the revenue stream we've got now, they want to continue the good times and start taking money out of the pockets of Alaska citizens. Ignoring statutes doing that. Just, just the wrong approach. Brad Keithley's our guest. We've got another segment coming up. We're going to continue that here in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show continues. Uh, this segment with Brad, uh, we've been advertising it this whole last week that we're basically going to uh, take your phone calls in this segment because we always get a lot of calls afterwards, and I think sometimes it would behoove us to have Brad respond to uh, uh, respond to this stuff in real time. And so he's agreed to do this whole segment with us as a on a question and answer basis. We have some other articles, too, we can talk about if uh, nobody uh, calls in. But we do have a call, and I actually have an email. Paul writes in to says, Michael, my state senator and representatives, Walkowski and Sponholtz, just told me that the PFD was taken because we had a $2.5 billion shortfall. Walkowski asked me where I would pull the cash from. I told him that 249 budget amendments were proposed and not one was taken up. He told me those amendments only cut $200 million and where was the state to get the remaining cash? Will you ask Brad to lay out for the general public what we are paying for that we could trim to $2.5 billion? He goes, I'm upset as you are, but I'm not sitting in Juneau every day. Instead, I'm out busting my tail for my family trying to get by. I'd almost consider running for office, but I have a good job and don't want to come home nightly feeling dirty. So uh, let's see what Brad has to say about that. That 2.5B that we're still falling short on. Your thoughts, Brad? Well, there's there's three areas right off the top to look at, Michael. Um, and, and then there's a, a, a revenue source that we haven't tapped. The three, the three areas right off the top of the university system. We've built a university system that is that's too large for for the size of budget uh, we've got. The university lists uh, uh, from time to time lists peer institutions, uh, institutions that are that it believes are like it. It's list three: the University of Montana system, the University of Maine system, and the Southern Illinois University system. All three of those are funded about a hundred million dollars by their legislatures, respective legislatures, about a hundred million dollars less than the University of Alaska system is funded. On a per student basis, those three systems, the peer systems, are funded in, in the range of between $5,000 to $10,000 uh, per student by their state legislatures. The university, the Alaska University system is funded at more than $20,000 per student uh, by the state legislature. So there's about 100, a little bit more than $100 million uh, that's built into the university system that has, that has made it too big for, for, for the for the economy, the size of economy of Alaska, and it needs to be cut. The second is Medicaid. Medicaid falls into two categories, mandatory uh, uh, services that are mandated by the federal government. If you're going to have a Medicaid system, you've got to provide these services. The other are optional. Uh, there's, we, we spend a little bit over $600 million in Medicaid in the state of Alaska. Uh, half of that roughly is under the mandatory prog uh, programs. Half of that's under the, uh, the optional programs. Uh, there are states like Arizona and others that have only adopted the mandatory programs, have not adopted any, any, any optional programs. Uh, 
Uh, Alaska, on the other hand, uh, is uh, it has adopted the most optional programs of any other state. That is, we've we've opted in to spend the most state money uh, of any other state. There's there's historical reasons for that, but but you can look at models like Arizona and others uh, to to cut those programs back. That's about enough to back to the mandatory programs. That's about another three hundred million dollars. There are a number of 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 public sector jobs that are authorized uh, in our budget that aren't filled with actual people. Actually, what that's being used for is to create additional funding to, to agencies that they then use for other things other than to fill those jobs. Uh, it's sort of a, an off-the-books way of getting additional funding to agencies. Um, we, can cut, we should cut back uh, the funding uh, to the agencies to just the number of jobs that they've actually got filled, the number of, of people that they actually uh, think they need as opposed to these phantom positions that we're funding in order to sort of you know, run money over the side. Uh, to some of these agencies, that would be another significant cut. So those three, those three cuts uh, are things that we would take right off the top that would start getting the, the budget down. On the other side, on the revenue side, we've never implemented Hammond's 50/50 program. Governor Hammond, uh, when he when he outlined his his permanent his proposal for the use of permanent fund earnings, 50% to the people, 50% available to state government when oil was no longer sufficient to provide uh, uh, revenue, sufficient revenue to run the state, uh, to provide essential state services is, what, is, is exactly what Hammond said. We've never implemented that other 50 percent. That other 50 percent of earnings has, has sta stayed in the earnings reserve, never been brought into government. That's about, if you think about the other 50 percent, that's about another billion dollars of revenue that could be brought in by implementing Hammond's 50-50 uh, uh, and bringing that revenue into the state. Rather than do that, uh, the governor has the governor and the legislature have claimed fiscal crisis, um, and frankly used that as justification to cut the PFD uh, and and run up additional earnings that can be used for the state uh, in right. future years. If we if we implement Hammond 5050, that's another billion plus dollars that comes into the state's coffers that reduces reduces the deficit from the revenue side. So. Easy, easy, frankly, plan to get this deficit back to, to, to a smaller size without cutting the PFD and without going to, uh, uh, to other new sources of revenue. Legislators just don't want to hear it. Yep, and that's, uh, that's the big part. So, Paul, hopefully Brad answered your questions there on that as well. Donald's on the phone. He wants to talk with Brad about the Constitution. Brad, what's, or Donald, what's on your mind? Hi. Um, I've, I've heard Brad say statutes over and over and over. And there's a statute that does provide for the transfer. But the Constitution has priority over the statutes, and the Supreme Court case in the PFD was based on the Constitution, specifically Article 9, Section 7, that is the prohibition against dedicated funds. Uh, Brad also mentioned the cash for the oil and gas tax credits, you know, production tax for exploration and, and those credits. That is also a statute. Um, I'm very familiar with legislation. I'm very familiar with funding. I'm very familiar with dedication of funds. And when I worked on legislation, I always had to have the Constitution in one hand and the law, the statute I was writing in the other, because the statutes have to be consistent with the Constitution. And in this case, and I agree with Tim Bradner's article regarding the appropriations, that if you don't have a dedicated fund, then it is a matter of appropriations. It took a constitutional amendment to create the permanent fund. I mean, that's a good example. A few years ago, Governor Murkowski proposed transferring land to the University of Alaska with the earnings from that land to go into the endowment fund for the university. Similarly, the Alaska Supreme Court found that that was also an unconstitutional dedication of funds. And oil and gas tax credits, the permanent fund dividend, they are all subject to appropriation. They cannot be dedicated under the Constitution. Brad? Mr. Bullock, I love you. And, and, and I hope Juno's a nice, bright, uh, sunny day today, and I hope everything's going well down there. So here, here's my point, Don, um, about, about uh, what's going on here. The Supreme Court said 
that you that that the legislature and the appropriation process essentially can ignore statutes. Um, if there's not a if there's not a constitutional provision that requires the expenditure, that that the, that in the annual appropriation process, the, the 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 legislature can ignore the statute. But that doesn't that doesn't take the statute off the books. The statute still exists. And when we talk about rule of law, especially when when Tim and others on the on the Alaska Journal of Commerce side talk about rule of law, reliability, you've got to be able to you know live up to what what your commitments are. They're talking about the statutory commitments that that that, that, that the legislature made, and and I don't and I don't disagree with that. Yes, we ought to live up to statutes. Yes, we ought to we ought to comply with statutes. Supreme Court said you don't have to, but that doesn't mean we sh- that doesn't mean we shouldn't. And the statutes set out guidelines that that past legislatures have said this is what the rule of law. This is the, these are the rules that Alaska ought to follow. The legislature can change those rules at any time. I don't. I mean, I don't argue that they can go in and change the PFD statute. They can go in and change the cash flow oil credit, credit statutes, but they haven't. And as long as they haven't, those statutes are still on the books. So we ought. This state ought to be, as Tim, as even Tim's article talks about. You know, we need to have these. We, we should have statutes because they provide for transparency. They provide for reliability. They provide for predictability. They provide for things that statutes that you. That, that you rely on statutes to do. As long as those statutes are still in the books, we ought to live up to them. Yes, the Supreme Court said you don't have to, that you, that you in every, legislat- every legislature can decide to short pay against the statutes unless there's a constitutional provision that says you, you have to pay. Yes, the, the, the legislature can short pay. Yes, the legislature can default, as some people have used that term, applying it to the cash flow oil credits program. But they shouldn't. We have statutes on the books. They should live up to them. Uh, uh, and if they if they aren't going to do that, then have the guts to change it. And if you don't change the statute, still live up to it. That that's my point. So uh, under the Constitution that that prohibits the dedication of funds, when you see a statute, for example, the oil and gas tax credit recognized the percentage of production taxes received as a source of funding to pay for those credits. And that's not a dedication, but it does recognize the fact that the legislature expresses an intent to do something. Now, they can't be required to do it because it's unconstitutional, but it says, you know, we're going to make our best effort to pay for those credits. Similarly, the PFC is going to make the best effort to pay for the credits, but there's no dedicated fund for that under the Constitution. Yeah, that was the Supreme Court case. Don, the other case, Don, I'm not, I'm, on the longevity boda that went away. That's a statute that's still on the book, but it went away because it wasn't funded. Yeah, Don, I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that that there's a dedication of these funds. I mean, yeah, the the the, the, the Supreme Court's decided that issue with respect to the PFD. They decided it before with respect to other issues, other issues. But 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 we have we have categorizations in this state. You and I both know this. Of unrestricted general funds, that is funds that can be spent for a lot of different purposes, designated general funds, DGF, funds that 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 there are statutes on the books or other or other policies in place that say these revenue sources ought to be used for these purposes. That's what our statutes say, or that's what our that's what our policies say. And then and then you know dedicated funds, which are very rare, and the Constitution deals with those. P, P, both the cash flow oil credits and the PFD fall in the category of designated general funds, the, the, the legislature ought to follow the statutes or have the guts we're, to change the statutes if they don't. 